Thank you so much for joining us, James. How are you? Pretty good. A little tired. <laughs> uh, what time zone are you? Are you currently in Utah? Yeah, I'm in Utah, so mountain time, but we had a big balloon festival this morning uh, called the Freedom Festival, where a bunch of hot air balloons fly up, and so you have to wake up pretty early to go see that. So James, one of the things that I noticed about you is that you've been making videos for 10 years now. Um, your earliest is about 10 years um, on YouTube, um, talking about SEM and educating people. And uh, But for some reason, you haven't been in an interview. I think this is probably the first time you would be talking to someone with actually a face on the video. Is there a specific reason for that or you were just too focused on your videos? Oh, yeah, this is the first podcast for sure uh, that I've done about structural equation modeling. I uh, usually I get asked you to go do workshops or boot camps or seminars or or some webinar, um, but nothing in the media at all. Is it a personal choice or nothing came up? Oh, I think SEM is just such a niche area uh, and so academic that nobody cares. Oh, that's I mean, it's just not a it's, <laughs> it's not a sexy topic. True, but then there, I'm, I'm pretty sure there are a lot of people who are in PhD programs and graduate programs who have benefited from your videos. For example, I personally am a huge fan of your work. You know, during my doctoral program and uh, my master's study, um, I found your videos very helpful. I, earlier on my podcast, we had um, Dr. Marcus Arshted, um, who is one of the architects of Smart PLS, one of the softwares that you've made videos about. Um, and we talked uh, about some of the quantitative um, issues in modeling. and. When you started this channel, was it um, the intricacy um, that urged you uh, to make videos to help out other people? I mean, you were a grad student back when you started that, or how did you come up with the idea? So um, I actually got a B, no, a C, a C in statistics in college. Um, I only passed because I was sitting next to a, a, some student who was way smarter than I was. Um, and then when I took graduate statistics, I got a B again, only because I was sitting next to somebody smarter than me. Um, and so when I got to my doctoral program in Cleveland, my professor saw my transcript and said, eh, you need to take statistics <laughs> if you're going to be a professor. So he stuck me in this executive doctorate class um, with all these people who were you know, CEOs and C-level suites or C-level execs. And um, and they were paying to be there quite a bit. And I was a free doctoral student, a young pup. And he said, here's what you're gonna do. You're gonna sit down, you're gonna shut up and you're not, you're not gonna draw any attention to yourself, um, which was very hard for me. I'm quite the extrovert. Pretend um, to be a so, CEO. <laughs> you, wait, well, I didn't look the part. I, I looked younger than I look now. Uh, this was at least a decade ago. And um, so I, I did a really good job staying quiet for about 30 minutes. Um, yeah, but the, the problem was they were teaching these executives how to do statistics by teaching them formulas and how to uh, enter data in Excel and write equations in Excel and, and um, all this really highly technical stuff that they had people for. I, they didn't have time for this. They just need the reports. And they were having to learn all these little intricacies in the statistics, which, and, and, I, and I could see them because I was in the back of the room watching everybody and you could just see them throw up their hands, push their laptops away, um, just put their hands or their head in their, in their hands, just shaking their heads and looking at each other like, is anybody else getting this? And so, I mean, I felt for them. So I, with, with a background in information systems and programming, um, I didn't have a real hard time picking up the technical side of everything. So I jumped ahead and made a little tips and tricks tutorial for everybody in the class, for everything the teacher was trying to teach them. And, but everything that they were trying to teach, uh, there were so many like barriers and, and places where you could totally trip up. And if you made one mistake, entered one thing wrong, you were just sunk and you couldn't follow along. And so I ran into those myself, but I understood why I ran into them. So I, I made little guides and FAQ and a tips and tricks tutorial um, to guide them through this. And I made that all before the lunch uh, for that executive residency. And I secretly distributed it among the students during lunch because I wasn't supposed to be drawing any attention to myself. Um, and after I distributed it, a lot of the students really appreciated it. 
Um, and after lunch, a kind of funny thing happened. Uh, the teacher was trying to teach something and the students obviously weren't getting it. And one of the executives raised their hand, said, James, and turned away from the professor and over towards me, <laughs> said, James, could you explain how to do this? And uh, it was pretty awkward. It was, it was really awkward. Um, but I then, from that moment on, became the teaching assistant for that class and would help translate everything the teacher uh, taught. And then uh, I, I started making YouTube videos for it. So uh, the first tips and tricks uh, tutorial was actually just a PDF. Um, and then I thought th this is very mechanical, very procedural. Reading through a PDF or through a book is, is not very helpful in something that's procedural. And so I made a screencast YouTube video and posted that for my class and had no idea that anyone else would be interested. Um, I just thought it would be used internally for this class. But then it started getting thousands and thousands of views. And I made a few more videos in the meantime, and those got tens of thousands of views and even hundreds of thousands now uh, on some of these videos. And people from all over the world, um, particularly India, Malaysia, uh, a lot of the Middle Eastern countries, Turkey quite a bit, uh, Australia, um, people started emailing me and asking me questions which was really awkward because I was not an expert. I was a, I was a graduate student uh, who had just took it, taken a class on this stuff. And so I knew essentially just what my teachers had told me and what I had stumbled into. I think it's such a fascinating concept that people think that whatever they're doing, it's not relevant to anyone else. And we have had YouTube celebrities on my show. Um, we have um, Joshua Starmer from StatQuest, probably know of him and Louis Serrano is a quantum scientist. Um, they started your YouTube channel thinking um, that you know the problems that they have, they probably will make a video and someone else would find it interesting. Turns out millions of people would actually watch their videos. And it, it's such an interesting concept that, you know, a lot of people are in the same shoes around the world, uh, but few actually go out and make videos about that. So when you're in an executive class of uh, this, um, you know, boisterous student who couldn't, you know, speak, uh, be quiet for more than 30 minutes. What was the exact um, pain points of these students? I mean, what I'm thinking is what is the mismatch between what teachers is, is teaching and the students are not understanding that? I mean, there's always kind of, is it the notation uh, or the statistical equations that they find hard or was it the teaching style or was it the concept itself? Uh, there were a few things for sure. Uh, the first was that they were using uh, um, a software package on their laptops to do statistics. And most of these people had not used a laptop in the past five to 10 years. This was 10 years ago, and these were executives. Uh, they were 50 years plus. Um, and so they had people who did that stuff for them. Their main role was to read reports and interpret them and make decisions based on these reports. Their role was not in, in their jobs, not in this class, but in their jobs, that's what they do. They just make decisions based on reports that are generated for them. Uh, they don't generate those reports. They don't do the analysis for those reports. And so trying to teach them a syntax-based statistical uh, package, software package, was just asking for, for, for them to overcome so many hurdles. First, they had to relearn how to use a, a computer. Some of them, no joke, had not used a mouse before. Um, it's just the nature of, of are you exaggerating music. now no no i am not there i i, can, I won't tell you his name did they go to high uh, school or... once well, this guy was 60 and he didn't grow up with computers and he grew up as a businessman and as computers became relevant he didn't use them he had his people use them and do this the, do the data analysis and the number crunching and they just generated reports so that he could make good decisions. But he was the businessman and he never had owned a computer before. And here he is trying to learn advanced statistics on a computer, not knowing what a right click is or a left click, what, what that means. Um, and so, and he wasn't the only one. And there were several students between that and, and all the way down the spectrum to engineers and accountants who use Excel and, and other uh, data software every day. So that was one hurdle was just getting them to understand how to use a computer because they would be told to do something like 
like, you know, draw this box or arrow or, or, or type in this formula. But if they got lost, they were lost. They had no clue what had caused the error. They had no clue what might cause an error. And so that was a lot of the tips and tricks is if you run into this error, it's because you did this. If you ran into this error, it's because you did that. Um, and so just helping them through those sort of frequently asked questions. Um, and then the other thing was they're trying to take notes because they know they're going to forget the procedure, but they're trying to do the procedure as they're taking notes, as they're listening to a completely different language, because statistics is a different language. Even if you speak English as a first language and you're hearing it in English, it's a different language. And so they're trying to super multitask on a device they don't know how to use properly. And uh, so, so that's one of the reasons I made the videos is so they could go back, they could pause, they could rewind, they could play it slowly. Um, and so I have students who would later say, I think I've rewatched one of your videos about 50 times um, just to get things right. Yeah. And, and another one who said, my husband knows your voice better than he knows my own because he hears you talking on my computer all day long. I must have been real uphill struggle because now when I teach doctoral seminars um, with a lot of students coming from medical background and social sciences backgrounds and natural sciences backgrounds, half of the class end up becoming uh, a computer course um, with Excel. And, you know, when you try to teach them compli complications with CFA and EFA and moderation and mediation, you can only imagine how long does it actually take. It turns out to be a semester job and not a workshop and job. But let's talk a little bit about your papers. Um, sure. Most of your background comes uh, or work comes with structural equation modeling um, using different softwares. At least your videos talk about that. Um, but one of your papers um, is the latest paper is about partial least squares structural equation modeling for building and testing behavioral causal, causal theory, when to choose it and how to use it. Um, and you argue that um, why is it appropriate for behavioral science uh, modeling? And that's something that we do at uh, my company, and that's um, something um, that I've been trained for. And do you see a little bit of problem here with latent variable modeling when it comes to human behavior? Because there are a lot of um, decision-making faculties going on in um, human brain and modeling all of that um, in a theory and establishing that turns out to be a gargantuan problem. So when you wrote this paper, uh, you must have thought about all of these um, issues. So how do you think that you know that can align with the structural equation modeling capabilities? So you bring up several sort of talking points here. Um, and, and, and their depths to several of the points you've made. The, the overarching question, if I understood correctly, is how well suited is structural equation modeling for understanding human behavior? Is that what you're asking? Yes, and do we have evidence for that? Ah, so this is uh, a quite a combative topic among scholars. And I am uh, more the pragmatist than the dogmatist, if that's a word. Um, I, I see the value in statistics, but I take the findings with caution. Um, anytime a statistician or anytime a report comes out and says, X leads to Y, uh, that is, that is very, uh, what's the word, a, very much any economic theory where we're ignoring, we're willfully ignoring dozens and maybe hundreds of other uh, potential confounds in this relationship. And so will I go out and uh, advise one of my companies to go spend $10 million uh, on this finding? Uh, we, we find that, let's pretend for basicness, uh, autonomy leads to job satisfaction, right? Uh, am I going to say, all right, change work policy. From now on, you have no managers. Everyone decides what they're going to do, and you do it. So you'll all be happy. Um, because some structural equation model by Dr. Who, you know, whoever, uh, said that this finding has some statist statistically significant p-value. I, I do not take statistics that seriously. Uh, and 
it's tricky because I teach statistics to a lot of people and they're always looking for the p value or for the r square or for the some some uh, definitive and I got to put that in air quotes definitive cutoff or threshold that oh I hate using this word that proves I'm going to put that in air quotes as well that proves that their hypothesis is again in air quotes true those are the worst scientific words possible uh, they aren't scientific words they're the, they're the worst words to use in science what we're doing with statistics is trying to approach approximations of truth uh, we we see the world we think it's some way we collect evidence we run statistics on that evidence and rather than proving that our theory is right we are providing support that maybe our theory is useful at approximating reality. And that's as far as I will trust statistics. You see, this is exactly the same question that I um, asked Marco uh, because it, it resonates me uh, with me a lot that approximating reality is a very um, hard concept um, and establishing numbers um, based on abstract ideas is even harder concept, especially in psychology. This is exactly why it's a huge issue, which research to trust and which research not to trust. And then, like you said, the cutoff scores, I mean, what score is good? Is it 0.3, is it 0.5, is it 0.6, or is it industry-based? It's based? a target. It's a target. It's not a cutoff. It's a, a target. moving target. <laughs> yeah. It, it's an indicator of probable or possible support for your theory. Do you get a lot of uh, lashback um, for saying that as a statistics professor? Yes, only from those who don't understand. From other statisticians, I do not. They agree. Uh, the more you know, the more you know that statistics can only get, take you so far. The less you know, the more you trust the statistics. And also one of the problems with um, most of the academic research is the fact that their sample size um, is, is limited to whatever they can get their hands on. Um, and I talk to a lot of people now that I'm in industry and I'm not in academia anymore. And the concept of big data where you have petabytes of data or terabytes of data, these relationships are not very easy to establish. Um, can you see a situation in which structural regression modeling would be applied to big data. I'm, I'm not sure if you're familiar with uh, or if you work with industry on a big data, but you know, it already takes a lot of competition power to be able to run algorithms on a data of that scale. Uh, how hard do you think it would be for a structure regression modeling to run on big data? It would be exceptionally difficult. Uh, right now, when people ask uh, how big is too big of a sample size, how big is too big of a model, typically I say if you have more than 100 variables, or more than 10,000 uh, data points, then your software is really gonna go slow. Um, especially if you're bootstrapping, oh man, you're gonna be waiting hours, even on the top end machines. And uh, so trying to wrap my head around SEM applied to big data, it just gives me a headache because big data makes 10,000 seem like a drop, right? 10,000 data points, that's nothing, nothing at all and you wanna run statistic or SEM on that. The problem is, and I know nobody can see my hands right now, um, but the problem is if you can picture it, SEM, uh, at least covariance-based SEM, uses a covariance matrix where every variable is related to every other variable. So every time you add another variable, you're not adding just one more relationship, you're adding N more relationships and N is the number of variables in the model. So you, every time you add a variable, it gets increasingly more complex. And when you're trying to rotate matrices of 10, well, of, of 100 variables, 100 rows, 100 columns, and trying to track that and iterate over it, especially when you're bootstrapping through, let's say, a million records, oh my goodness. I mean, the computational power required for that is just mind-blowing. Eventually, we'll get there. I think we will, uh, computationally. The software needs to catch up a little bit. Most uh, statistics software actually doesn't do parallel processing. It does single thread processing, which is very slow. 
That's not the only problem, though. Uh, the problem is that we already have this problem in industry, which is um, for the non-structured data and non-linear relationships, uh, and we solve it by deep learning. And the problem with deep learning is that once, even if you get a good accuracy, you don't know what's happening in the model. So explainability becomes a huge issue. And I think that that's probably the life and death question for academics. I mean, you need to be able to explain what's happening in the model and establish it with the numbers. So even if you were computationally to achieve that accuracy, do you think that would be a problem uh, when it comes to explainability? Uh, structural regression model over millions um, of lines, um, that now you have to explain what's happening in it. Uh, yes, yes. The bigger problem probably, well, to rewind a little bit, uh, people also don't know what's going on in structural equation modeling. I'm actually writing a paper right now on this. Uh, the, the same co-author who I wrote the PLS article with, Paul Lowry, uh, he and I are writing a paper right now together uh, that talks about the, uh, the, the use of SEM as a tool uh, wielded ignorantly and how because SEM has uh, software applications like Amos and smart PLS that are so easy to use, those who have no knowledge of how they work are using them and coming exactly. up Exactly. And did you uh, see the papers coming out of, um, you know, Malaysian University, University using smart PLS3 with no cutoff scores, no theory, no nothing. And I was talking to Mark scary. about that also. It's unbelievable. And how are they going to get, how are they getting PhD degrees out of that cra crap? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I, I have definitely I have thoughts on that for sure. It, yeah, garbage in, garbage out um, of academia. But uh, because those software applications are so easy to use, all you do is like drag a box in this, you know, and an, and an arrow, and it comes up with a p value and, and a regression weight. And then you say, oh, yeah, my, my hypothesis is supported. Uh, because of that, people are wielding it and not having any clue what's going on underneath the hood. And, and I'm partially to blame for that. I've automated so many procedures in Amos and in M plus and other software. Uh, I've automated so many procedures that you don't have to know how to calculate some validity metric or some model fit metric. I do that for you or my software does. And so all I do is generate the report. And if, if it was garbage in, like if your model was invalidly specified or your data was invalid or, or who knows what else, your measures were invalid, my reports will still produce uh, results, but they'll be completely erroneous, completely invalid, but you'll see a regression weight and a p-value and will say, ah, my hypothesis is supported. So we're, we're writing a paper, Paul and me, we're writing a paper right now. It talks about this problem, but also says, now here are all the criteria in order that you need to go through in order to say, ah, my hypothesis is supported and actually be confident that it was supported. I think if that was the only problem, I would be very happy. The, uh, the next problem is they're actually dropping items to make sure that you know they have um, the right construct scores and covariance and you know restricting factor numbers uh, to make sure that there's no discriminant validity. And that's almost academic dishonesty. Um, and then these papers are actually getting published in top journals. I said, what's happening here? It's, I mean, what would be the right way, in your opinion, to fix that situation? So this is an issue uh, I've actually gone back and forth with, um, with a gentleman, Jagdeep Singh. Uh, he is a well-known marketing uh, methodologist. And he has been upset with me before because of my videos that I made back when I was a very young scholar and had no clue what I was doing. And in fact, my most popular video, I think, uh, has some terrible, terrible behavior in it. I'm dropping items left and right, and I'm co-varying residuals, and there's terrible behavior. And I've responded to people and made co comments and stuff that this is terrible. You shouldn't follow this video. Uh, there are some good principles to it, but there are also some very bad principles to it. So Jagdeep and I are writing an article about these critical decisions people make that completely change their models, completely change their findings. And we, we sort of liken it to if, if an airplane takes off from Salt Lake City going to uh, Mumbai and is just one degree off when they leave Salt Lake, 
they're not going to land in Mumbai. They're going to land in like, like Beijing or something um, way off because of one tiny little decision, one tiny little offset at the very beginning. And this is sort of like deleting variables unnecessarily. It changes what you're measuring. And so there are still times to do that for sure. There are times to delete measures when they completely undermine the validity of your measurement. That's totally fine. As long as you are transparent about it and explain why you did it and what was removed and why it was removed. Uh, but doing it willy nilly to meet some imagined cutoff threshold uh, is terrible practice. I think in one of the worst part with academic publishing is that, you know, in some of the papers, they don't even give out all the data um, and the R code or the software um, to do, reproduce that, which is, um, I think it's a very faulty practice. No one should be able to blindly trust the paper in findings without looking at the data um, and the process that you have actually taken um, to get there. Um, and, um, but there are some developments in the field which seem promising, um, at least to me. Uh, in Smart PLS 3, they've introduced uh, a new discriminant validity construct, HTMT. Um, yeah. What do you think about that? Well, I love HTMT. Um, my philosophy on statistics in uh, scholarly endeavors is more information is better information. Uh, so I, I'm asked quite often, uh, which test do I need to do? Do I need to do the like Fornell Larker or the HTMT? or a correlation matrix comparison, or, or look at cross loadings, or what should I do for discriminant validity, or for method bias, or for model fit? And I say, all of it, do all of it, and report all of it. And if there's not enough room in your paper, put it in an appendix. And if there's not enough room there, well then summarize it, but say that you did it, so that you had as much information as possible to make sense of your data. It's like, I mean, it's like if you had a, 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 a picture behind 10 boxes, 10 little doors, and that the picture's hidden by these 10 little doors, and which one do you want to open to figure out what's on the picture? All of them, right? You want to open all of them so you can see every part of this picture. Um, if you only open one or two of them, you're going to have a skewed idea of what's, what's on the picture. Uh, with SEM, with statistics in general, more information is better information. So do it all. Yeah, but one of the problems is also that that box is also known as Pandora's box, because some of those things do not correlate well with each other for no reason. Um, and from a the theoretical point of view, some theories do not even have to have discriminant validity because a lot of factors are correlated with each other also um, in real life. For example, let's uh, talk about um, the office environment being conducive to productivity. So now, if you have good environment, that's going to make you more productive, but that's not the only reason. Um, and if you're calculating with other factors, they might, you know, correlate with each other. And people from a mathematical point of view would say that it's not discriminately valid because, you know, the factor loadings are mixing with each other. But from an uh, empirical view point of view, that would be perfect. So how do you deal with these issues? Um, are, are you a bit relenting on your own students when they come up uh, with those hiccups? Um, there, in statistics, there's always a compromise, always a balance. You, you want to have valid factors in terms of their convergence, right? That they're measuring one thing and valid factors in that they're not measuring the same thing as something else. You don't want to have a tautology. Um, but at the same time, in real life, in real life phenomenon, um, everything is related with everything to a large extent, uh, more or less. And so are you going to have perfectly pristine and crisp unrelated factors? No, and you don't want that either. You want things to be related. So it, it, it's a balancing act. You want, it to make, you want to make sure something is being measured distinctly and you want to make sure that anything that's predicting it is also being measured distinctly and that those distinct measures are measuring different things. But they can still be overlapping, it's sort of the Venn diagram idea, right? Uh, you just don't want them to be completely overlapping or else you know, you're predicting something with itself. Um, we're going to get back to this mathematical um, gymnastics, but uh, tell me what's 
common between mathematical modeling and gymnastics. You have been doing gymnastics for such a long time and professors generally are known for their receding hairline and not gymnastics. So <laughs> how, how did you get into that? What do you do? Gymnastics, wow, yeah. As a kid, um, I, I moved around a lot as a kid. This is actually my 31st home. Um, and I moved here when I was 30. Um, and, and so I moved around a lot. And when we were living in Japan, uh, back when I was 10, yeah, we were living just south of Tokyo. And I, I, was, I wanted to go make some friends. And so my mom thought, well, let's stick him in a gymnastics class where he can be with people regularly. And uh, so I took a gymnastics class in Japan, just a tumbling class, and loved it. I was also breaking a lot of furniture uh, at my house, doing flips off the furniture and flipping onto the couch and flipping off of the bed. And uh, so my mom thought there'd be more constructive location for that kind of activity. Uh, but I loved it, just absolutely loved it, and uh, took to it pretty well. And I uh, had, had the right build for it. I was kind of short and stocky and then moved out to California. And my mom was at the shopping center getting some fruit and she ran into uh, someone who just started chatting with her. That lady happened to be a gymnastics coach and a ballet coach in a small rural cow farming town um, and said she needed some help. So my mom volunteered me to go help coach um, gymnastics uh, with this lady. And I worked for her for a few years and learned a lot more, uh, but the studio was no bigger than the room I'm in right now, pretty much. It was this tiny little like basement uh, gymnastics facility, just floor again. And then we moved to Mississippi and uh, they had a full gym and I went and taught gymnastics and ballet there. And then, uh, but still just floor. I didn't do any of the equipment. They only had a girls uh, group, none of the boys. And then after uh, I moved to Malaysia for a couple of years, I came back and thought I'd love to really pursue gymnastics. I watched the Olympics that year and thought that looks really cool. I'd love to be able to do that kind of stuff. So I called up a gym and said, hey, I'd love to come coach for you. And they said, well, do you have any experience? And I said, yeah, but nothing with the men's equipment. I'd never done pommel horse or rings or P-bars or anything like that. And so they, they brought me on and trained me as we went. And from then I, I coached everything, boys team, girls team, tumbling, tramp, uh, recreational classes, even preschool classes briefly. Then the head coach decided I was terrible with children um, and took me out of that class. Um, turns out I'm better with, with, with uh, academics than with toddlers. Um, but I, I absolutely love gymnastics. I have a pair of rings, uh, still rings in my garage hanging from the ceiling. And so I do, I do iron crosses and stuff on the rings there. Um, and I've always wanted to get a pommel horse in my house, but there's no place to stick it uh, where I won't be kicking people, but one day. Do you get a lot of time these days to actually do gymnastics or academics give you? The time is one issue. Also, I'm getting old. Um, this year, going to the Olympics for the men's U.S. team, there's a gentleman named Sam McCulloch, and he is the grandpa of the team. He's 28. Um, and he's considered really, really old to be going to the Olympics. I am far more than 28. So I am like the great, great grandpa in uh, gymnastics. So my body doesn't tolerate, tolerate it very well. I used, to, I used to go in, one of my daughters were taking gymnastics. I used to go do gymnastics for the hour that they were doing it. And I just go do it on the side. But every time I'd come back injured and my wife would be like, what are you doing? Uh, and I'd have to wait another three months before I could do more gymnastics because I'd injure myself every time I got back onto the equipment, uh, just because I'm old and it's hard to, it's hard to recover and heal. So no, I'm not doing a lot of gymnastics. Maybe a little bit of trampoline in the yard and a little bit of rings in the garage, but that's it. It might have stopped gymnastics, but didn't actually stop you from moving a lot. I mean, I was just wondering what was 31 moves about, and what does your wife think about it? Oh man, so most of those moves were prior to me getting married. Not all of them, but, but uh, most of them. My dad did, I think, four years in the Air Force and 25 in the Navy and then 10 in the Marines, um, which is a lot of, of military service, but we moved constantly because of that. And so I went to nine different schools as a kid um, before I graduated high school. 
I sort of graduated. That's another story. I got kicked out of high school. I have to tell you that sometime. Um, I can only imagine from you cheating in the graduate statistics class. <laughs> Sorry, just <laughs> Not cheating. No, no, no. Just <laughs> failing. Um, but uh, then after I got married, we only moved around for school uh, to do college. But yeah, mostly as a kid, it was because of the mil military, my dad's military service. Was it hard for you to um, actually keep up with friends, make new friends and have some stability? It was tricky. Uh, there were seven kids in my family and um, not all of us liked moving a lot. I was the odd one. I, I think more than any of my siblings, I, I liked moving the most. Uh, I found it to be an awesome opportunity to completely change myself. If there was anything about myself that I didn't find it awesome, uh, when we lived in one area, I always knew I only had to tolerate myself for another three months or six months or nine months or whatever it was going to be. And then I could be a different person when I moved to the next place because nobody knew me except my family. So I could go to school as a totally reinvented kid and see if that worked. And if that didn't work, well, it's just another nine to 10 months uh, and I'll move again and I'll try again. And so I get to reinvent myself quite often, which was nice. It did teach me, though, to not get attached very much. So I don't really keep up with friends. Um, it, it, it'd be weird for me to, to uh, it, it would be weird for me to see if somebody from my past, um, at least from like pre-20 years old. I didn't know many people very long, so I don't think I'd recognize them and they wouldn't recognize me. But it, this was like pre-social media, pre-texting, pre-email. I'm old. Wow. Um, and uh, so I didn't keep up with anyone because that would mean writing letters and I'd move pretty soon thereafter and not know what address I'd have. And so forwarding mail and I it just doesn't work out. And in your case, that would be a lot of keeping up sooner. <laughs> I'd rather just yeah. move on. Um, well, let's get back to academics. Um, and one of the problems that um, I have personally found out when I'm hiring people and recruiting people from um, different backgrounds um, is that the mismatch between what we teach people in academics and what what they have to do in industry, and they're two totally different words. So to give you an example, uh, what we do with the theory um, and to test it mathematically, we do factor analysis to find out uh, if we have um, clearly distinct and discriminant factors. Now, an equivalent of that in data science would be feature engineering to find out what features are contributing to the most um, in predicting the dependent variable in a regression, or well, let's say the classification model. And the problem is that the people who come from um, a computer science background straight into data science, or let's say a couple of years of data engineering, um, they know how to use libraries from GitHub and use those models or deep uh, learning uh, networks to predict the dependent variable. But they have no idea how to explain these things. Um, from academics, when you bring them to industry, they know to explain, you know, they know the theory behind it, how to design studies, how to create factors, but they don't know the bigger picture. Is it actually valuable for the business to do all these things? So it's not always, it's always kind of a tussle between time and value. Do you see this mismatch and are you do, are these academics doing anything to um, fix that? Because in my opinion, it's getting worse. So tools, tools are getting better. Um, the use of them might be getting worse. Uh, and we're in this really rocky stage of data analytics where um, we're trying to analyze archival data, which was never intended to be analyzed en masse. Um, and so it's messy and, and messed up and uh, in many cases invalid or, or just completely wrong. And yet we're trying to apply these easy to use tools uh, to make sense of this data. And so we're in this sort of rocky place where the data is bad, but it's getting better. The tools are rough, but they're getting better. And eventually we'll live in a society where data is designed to be analyzed and tools are designed to analyze that data. Um, and it's not like trying to uh, patch up something that was never intended to be patched. So yeah, it's, it's tricky. Uh, do I think that there's use in data analytics when we don't know what's in the black box? 
yes, when it's accompanied with valid theory. But even then, it's a little tricky because I can come up with a theory for anything. In fact, uh, I, was, I was on this paper with um, a few of my buddies, one of whom is a very prominent scholar in our field. And I, I remember doing the, the data analysis and saying, guys, there's nothing here. What we thought was here, it's not here. We are not seeing any evidence for our theory. And so this prominent scholar says, well, what are you seeing? I said, well, it's, it's almost the complete opposite. And he says, oh, well, that makes sense because, and he comes up with some theory just off the top of his head that explains our findings. And that is the trouble with data analytics and business right now is it's data first theory, maybe. Um, whereas in academia, it's theory first data, hopefully. Um, and, and so the, I, 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 as I said at the very beginning, take statistics with, a bit of caution because you can you can find anything and you can explain away any finding and it's hazardous to then go and make decisions based on those findings especially when those findings might change by moving a few different data points re-slicing the data adding a new variable uh, removing a variable it's kind of you're, you're you're building on a sandy foundation unless you know what's what what that foundation is made of yeah, how this problem actually um, boils over to the point where um, it becomes an international stigma. For example, uh, one of my favorite books that I read when I was a graduate student, it's called How to Lie with Statistics. I don't know if you've um, read oh, yeah. that. Such a classic. Yeah, you can, I, can, I can make the data say anything, <laughs> anything you want. You just tell me what you want and I'll make it say that. No, I, I never do that. that. That's unethical. But I can. I have the skills to make the data say anything. Exactly. That's what Marco said. And, you know, that's what I can do. Also, you can simply design a research in a manner which points to your favorite outcome in any way. And one of the things is that um, being astute and crafty with numbers has been an evil genius. For example, there's a book called Confessions of, Confessions of Economic Hitman uh, by John Perkins, where he talks about um, all the evil doings of UN and its institution like World Bank and IMF, the go to country heads and, you know, they bribe them and, they can, and then make a mathematical model to predict their future needs, give them loans and then use their own companies to, you know, transport that money back to their these institutions. And I think that from a global point of view, from a morality point of view, that turns out to be a, a, a global curse not a boon that you know we have better tools so now we have better access to data so we'd be doing better it turns out that you know you can use it for the exact opposite um i don't know if you know about joseph stiglitz who was fired from imf um is one of the most um influential top 100 people um in the us um and he talks a lot about the free market economics um, and how un abuses its power use the statistics can you do you think that you know a lot of academics um, by their nature um are since they will be employed by these institutions they're incentivized to actually lie i think uh they're incentivized to produce results um i, I would argue results that, is the key word here yeah I, I would argue that those who produce uh false findings 95 percent of the time do it ignorantly rather than maliciously. There are those 5%, maybe it's as low as 2%, uh, who knowingly uh, warp data, uh, cook the books uh, in a manner of speaking to, to achieve whatever ends is economically uh, beneficial to them. But I would say that those who are producing bad results, um, bad findings or invalid findings, more often than not are doing it through ignorance, not through maliciousness. But you look at Enron. I mean, how how easy it is to yeah? That's an example of maliciousness. Yeah. Like, I mean, where are the regulatory um, bodies, um, an ombudsman, or anything that would just through the see the process through the years? At least at some point, they would have said, okay, the math doesn't actually add up. H how is that possible? I mean, in your opinion, is, is there a way, at least in academic where you are, to curb um, this situation? Um, especially when it's being done by people in, in authority. In many cases, the professors themselves do that. Undergraduate students simply have to go along with this. Uh, do, do you see there 
a trend like this or in some way to um, notice this before it gets bad? Do you mean uh, in the context of business or in the context of academia? Well, the tools itself, the cognitive modeling is being used in all disciplines. So it's not business or education. It's just like overall where the research is being done. So I'll still speak to each of those groups, I think. So in okay. academia, uh, we have, of course, peer review um, that hopefully catches bad behavior. And now that only works if the data is made available and the reviewers are diligent and if the reviewers are also experts. Now, all of those combined and uh, honest. parameters, what, sorry? <laughs> and honest as well. Oh, and honest, yeah. Uh, all of those parameters combined rarely come together uh, that you have at least one methodologist expert on a paper review team um, and that the data is available and that the data hasn't been tampered with. All of that is a little tricky to get all together. Uh, of course, but we're trying, of course, to put in those checks and balances. In business, it's the same, and in government, it's the same. Uh, you're supposed to have third-party reviewers. Of course, we know that in business, third-party reviewers are often uh, second cousins to these companies. Uh, they're not really third parties, and they could be influenced for sure, but they're supposed to be independent third-party reviewers. There are uh, well-known companies who provide such reviews, like the big accounting firms who are not supposed to be bought uh, and paid for because it's not worth it to them to lose their credibility. So ho hopefully there are checks and balances and, and people who are attentive and, and honest. Yes, it's very interesting. Actually, in Big Four, I was talking to Doug Laney, who is a Forbes contributor and the ex VP of Gartner. And it was kind of funny that, you know, Big Four gets paid by the companies who they're auditing. So did you see the conflict of interest here? There's definitely a conflict of interest, but it's it's in their mission. It's it's in their, their write-up. Uh, they, cannot, they cannot be anything but transparent or else they lose credibility and they lose work. <laughs> yeah, I like they abide by that as a Bible. <laughs> well, anyway, let's move to yeah. another question, which is another paper of yours, which found my, um, caught my eye and quite early. Um, and it relates with a lot of um, the early classical psychology. Uh, and the paper is about um, hedonic, uh, hedonistic motivation systems, uh, where uh, the behavioral modeling is influenced by reward system and kind of matches with the early Pavlovian um, positive and negative reinforcement. And I was just wondering, how do you actually model that restructured question uh, modeling uh, to understand the dynamics of what's going on? So to understand why people use systems in a with, with a hedonistic motivation, um, there's been actually this topic has had quite a bit of uh, scholarly back and forth and arguments around it. Is there such a thing as a hedonic system or are systems just systems and humans use them with a hedonic motivation? Um, and most research nowadays is leaning towards the latter. Uh, systems are systems. Maybe the designers intended them to be used uh, for fun and for pleasure or for utility. Um, but the way a user uses them is totally up to the user. I can use Excel to have fun. I mean, all the time. Uh, I love statistics. Is that a hedonistic use? Probably, because um, I get a kick out of statistics. But other people would say, no, it's purely utilitarian. Anyway, but back to your question. Uh, can you use structural equation modeling to actually understand that kind of behavior and motivation? And the answer goes back to what I said at the beginning. Yeah, sort of. Um, you can use it to make sense, make better sense of some phenomenon like human behavior and human motivation. Is it the definitive work on, or is it the last word on that behavior? Absolutely not. Humans are messy. Human cognition is even messier. Human motivation is even messier. And so trying to pin something down and, and put it in focus uh, when it's that chaotic, it's it's tricky. So the only thing you're going to get out of structural equation modeling and something this messy is maybe a little bit better understanding of the phenomenon, but definitely not the definitive finding and the end-all, be-all uh, last word on the topic. 
Yeah, someone who has traveled the world and is very um, well uh, versed in statistical methods. Uh, do you see a, a similarity between the hedonistic system um, and the Pavlovian psychology in the sense that dogs are motivated and salivating when they have meat in front of them, which is kind of the primal um, instinct. But humans don't actually have that um, in the reward systems in organizations that is a salary um, or something that they can find somewhere else also. So switching job is one part of that. Unless, um, unlike dogs, you do not um, salivate over money. Um, and then to apply but the so same, <laughs> well, I hope for most people. So uh, to, to actually capture all the um, quantitative points of that and putting all that variable in an equation, um, that seems to be a point of um, a contention among a lot of uh, researchers. Do you see from, not from a statistical point of view, from your uh, observational point of view, um, I've seen the word, do you, do you think that it stands true in most situations? For sure. Um, there's this word in academia, endogeneity. Um, endogeneity is all about failing to account for some other variables, some unknown confound that that seems to be uh, creating an inflationary relationship between uh, two measured variables. A good example is, um, let's say we, we measure two things. We measure whether you're carrying a lighter in your pocket and whether you have lung cancer. Um, I have found through my statistical analysis that when you carry a lighter in your pocket, you're far more likely to have lung cancer. Um, there's this huge relationship. So if people would just stop carrying lighters in their pockets, well, then they wouldn't get lung cancer, right? Well, there's this big endogeneity issue going on where uh, there's a third variable we're not measuring, which is, do they smoke? And if they smoke, they both carry a lighter and get lung cancer. So if we don't measure whether they smoke, well, then our theory is useless. The statistics around the theory are useless and even misleading. Uh, let's say we then go spend a bunch of money on advertising, telling people to stop carrying lighters. If you're gonna, if you're gonna smoke, uh, carry matches or something like that. Use a magnifying glass and to, to light your cigarettes. Um, the science, the findings, they're misleading. And so can, can we use SEM? advanced statistics for uh, making sense of these complex behavioral and, and cognitive phenomenon? No, not really. We, we can make some more sense. We can come, as I said at the beginning, we can make approximations of truth, um, but we sure can't, can't be 100% confident in what we found because we're never gonna measure all the variables. You can't, it's impossible. That's why economists uh, simplify. It's supply and demand, right? Well, no, it's not. It's like supply and 10,000 other things, including how the weather is and whether there's a pandemic going on and whether the guy who runs the, the, the cargo ship was paying attention and, and so many other things in, in economic models. And it's the same in behavioral and cognitive models. There are a thousand variables and you can't account for all of them. You see, uh the perception among common people is that academics are supposed to give us the results and, and the lessons from mathematical modeling um, to the T. And once they've done um, the things for us, life would be a lot easy. By the nature of um, how there is always um, an endogeneity, uh, it pretty much renders all the work in academia quite useless and hilarious for a lot of other people what's going on. What can we do to actually substantiate some of our work, which would um, at least mean something? Because frankly, at least in structured regression modeling literature that I've read in uh, the recent papers, it seems like an intellectual exercise with no um, practical utility. Yeah, this is an argument a lot of scholars have with themselves and with each other. Uh, is all social science just useless, right? Uh, if, if humans are so messy and human uh, relationships and cognition and motivation and behavior are so messy and we can't measure it all, then why are we measuring any of it? And what we like to tell ourselves and what I hope is maybe partly true is that by trying to make sense of messy phenomena, we are 
understanding it better. And if we understand it better, well, then hopefully we'll, we'll make better decisions as a business, as an individual, uh, and not just academics. The, the science we produce in academia eventually trickles down into uh, popular press and popular media and into behavior in the home and in the business. Um, at least we like to tell ourselves that. We don't know what kind of a lag there is on that. Uh, that, that could be an interesting study. But uh, by simply pursuing research questions around phenomena that matter, uh, we will understand our world better. You know, the academic system, however, puts the wrong incentive um, for people, though. So if you want to be a faculty member, you want to get hired, you want to pr get promoted, all you have to do is to do publish and you have to publish in good journals. And for that, even if you don't come up with something, because remember, um, negative results or confounding variable results doesn't matter. Um, and these are some of the things that incentivize academics to conjure up numbers and papers and theories to simply get published. So one of the latest developments that happened in the Nature published um, this news um, a week ago is that University of Utrecht in the uh, Netherlands became the first one that is dropping the um, citations criteria for hiring and promotion. Um, for example, what they're saying is that the um, citations from high ranking journals um, or low ranking journals is not a reflective measure for the ability of an individual researcher, because if there is a specific number of uh, spots um, in an issue, not everyone can make it. And you know, some people might wait for a year to actually get there. And that does not mean that they should be denied promotion or tenure because of that. Uh, and a lot of people have welcomed this idea. And you know, a lot of graduate students have left the field um, and academics because of that, because of mental issues, there's a lot of stress going on. Do you think that's just, that's a promising direction to move in? Yes. Um, I recently uh, just left, not left, uh, I finished my time on the department level rank and status committee. I'm currently in the college level at the Marriott School uh, rank and status committee. So I evaluate these tenure packages all the time. And what's funny, funny, sad, uh, broken, what's broken is that I guess case in point with me, I am most well known for my YouTube videos. I have millions of views. My stat wiki has been viewed tens of millions of times. All of that amounts to zero publications. Like I, none of those are an A hit, right? And I need an A hit, a top tier, tier one public, uh, publication to get promoted. So if, if uh, this isn't the case with me, but if this is all I did, and uh, granted, I'm influencing a lot of people with these videos, a lot more than my research is, I would think. Um, in fact, I have far more YouTube video views than I have uh, journal citations um, by multiple orders of magnitude. Uh, but if this was all I did uh, to influence academia, it wouldn't be enough to promote me. I also need to publish in our top three journals multiple times, um, regardless of what that research goes on to do, uh, whether it changes behavior, changes uh, the way we think, changes processes in business. That's not so much the, the, the metric we're going for. The metric is how many times did you publish in this journal um, or in this set of journals? And all my YouTube videos and influence on, on online that's a nice afterthought. You know, 80 to 90% of um, research is not even read. Um, I mean, I have... I would say it's 99%. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, uh, you know, that's... I'm a visiting professor in university here also. And despite being asked, and never joined because I know that there is no contribution that these people actually make for the rest of the world, apart from these journals, which... Pro frankly, no one reads anymore. So my research gate papers are studied for 14,000 times now, and I have never published in a journal. So I just simply write paper, then I just put it up on RFX or research gate, you know, you're um, free to take them and publish them in your name, it doesn't matter to me. But the problem is that, you know, uh, a lot of these people 
who are really doing the good work are not rewarded with the academic criteria. And in Australia, I believe there is a system, and I would like to have your view on that also. I think in Australia, what they do is that you have a track like work to education um, platform through which you can get your work recognized as an academic qualifications. I was talking to um, one of the Wall Street bankers that I, um, I had recently on my show about you know, if you don't incentivize CEOs and VPs and people who have practical experience through recognition, um, academic recognitions with um, doctors or let's say some kind of invitations to different universities to teach in a semester and talk about their uh, work, I mean, what good is an academic professor who has never done anything practical um, in a in a in a sector where it actually matters do you think that's also something that should be done you know you bring these people who've done pragmatic things to universities and create a public academic uh, partnership and give them the recognition that they have done for a lifetime certainly i wish there were other things uh, that were motivated or incentivized uh, the only thing right now as you mentioned that's incentivized is publications and top journals and, and good teaching in many institutions. <clears throat> Excuse me. So uh, in order for me to have a successful career uh, in terms of an academic success, there are so many things I don't have to do. I don't have to care too much about um, my practical impact. I don't have to care about the companies in my hometown. I don't have to care about how my research changes uh, the world or uh, to a large extent, I don't have to care too much about my students as long as I teach okay, right? And uh, as long as I show up to my meetings, nobody's gonna fire me, I've got tenure. Um, and so if I, if I just meet those minimum thresholds, uh, I'm fine as an academic. Uh, if I stop doing my YouTube videos right now and stop responding to YouTube comments every day, I'd still get promoted. Uh, if I'm publishing in the journals, because we have metrics, if we meet those metrics, we're good. It's like the p-value. P-value is 0.05. Do we reach 0.05? Hey, we're good. Um, forget all the rest. But uh, for professors who love their job, who love their their field, uh, they will do more. Um, I, I've, I've talked to my buddies about this. What, what is it about a professor who, that makes that professor more than an academic? Uh, but makes them a true scholar. And it's, it's the passion they have for ideas and for um, developing other people and, and changing the world, which is why I do all the things I do. Uh, I, my, wife, my wife often, not often, she has occasionally asked me, what if you just did your job? You know, just, just the one you're paid for. Uh, <laughs> instead of all this other stuff, I've, I've started what eight companies in the past eight years or so. And I, I mentor a ton of people. I work for, um, I, I, I adjunct at another university. Uh, I make all these YouTube videos and spend time on that. I invent things and build things. I make apps and it, you gotta be passionate about what you do. And if you are, it's gonna lead into doing way more than you're incentivized to do. But if you don't love your job, you're gonna do what you're incentivized to do and that's it. Yeah, but isn't it a wrong precedent for professors? I mean, you simply have to show up and get paid, and that's taxpayer money um, that you're you're getting to actually produce something of value. I mean, I'm talking about Josh. You know, he was a professor for 13 years um, in uh, University of North Carolina, I believe, and then he left for his own company. And same with Louis, also has been switching jobs. And it's unfortunate to see all these great people who could have made a difference. They were super passionate about what they're doing and the world wants to listen to them. And they're not in university anymore. Uh, just because the system incentivizes people who don't do all of that. And there's no credit for what they're actually doing to make difference. Um, and I was just wondering, do, have you as a person, I mean, you sit on different boards um, as associate editor or editor. And I was wondering, have, have you tried to pitch the idea uh, among your peers or they just want to live in ivory towers? Oh, I, uh, I remember even as a doctoral student, I would pitch ideas to the senior scholars and say, hey, this is broken, let's fix it. Um, one of the ideas I had was to make a video journal of information systems. Uh, the whole journal would just be short videos, uh, essentially a YouTube idea, a YouTube channel back before YouTube was really a thing. Um, and I remember pitching that to the senior scholars and they all said, 
why would we do that? We could just read the paper. I'm like, yeah, but none of your students want to read these stupid <laughs> papers. They fall asleep while they read them and then they finish reading them an hour later and they have no clue what they've read. They could watch a five minute video or watch a you know, two hour playlist with 20 different videos in there. And they'd have your whole journal read and understand it and enjoy it. I um, mean, they shot me down. They thought that was a terrible idea. <laughs> I think there there is a startup now um, that's actually that actually sends over the team in your lab. You know, yep. they do. The, um, I don't, I just forgot the name, but I think it's a good oh. movement. But uh, just give me your take on a new development, a University of Threat that I just talked about. Um, what they're doing is that in, when they abandon the citation criteria, what they're adopting is open science. So what they want to see is that, you know, if this person has published uh, openly, if he's contributed in the field, um, he's active, you know, he's making videos, he's probably taking into consideration um, the other parts um, of this person's uh, academic life than simply um, citations. Um, and some of their de developments are Arvix um, and um, open access journals, um, then GitHub repository, which is more of a common with the computer science graduates. Do you think that's something that can turn out to be a model for a lot of people uh, going forward, um, either within academia or leaving academia for that? So there are a couple issues there. Um, the One of the main reasons we've stuck with citations and which journal you've published at and how many journals you uh, articles you've published is because it's easy, right? It, it's really easy and cut off criteria you can count the number of pubs, you can count the number of citations, and it's universal. Like I can do that across all the departments in my college and all the colleges and the university. And so we have a universal metric. Whereas trying to gauge how influential someone is and how much they've changed their field and how passionate they are and how much they're doing outside of uh, the classroom that is really hard, especially across departments, because <clears throat> the stuff I do it doesn't translate super well. <clears throat> excuse me. It doesn't translate super well to maybe the dance department or the English department or the religious studies department. Um, even within the business school, what I do doesn't translate to the accounting department, but citations do and journal articles do. And so it's just easy. It's easier to stick with this sort of broken system that's easy to count. Uh, if we were to move over to a more qualitative assessment, that would mean more work for administrators. And since admi administrators are making the decisions on what we evaluate, uh, they're, they're probably not going to make it harder for themselves. So where did this vicious circle stop? Because, you know, then people are going to stick to it until their last breath. For example, look at I mean, you great students, but let's grade you here. So I went to um, rate my professor, and that's what your oh, no. score. You, that's what your scorecard says. Um, so it's four out of five rating, very good in economic settings when people oh, can good. say anything. And then you have adjectives defining you as caring, uh, but homework heavy and test heavy and um, hilarious. You know, I mean, what kind of person wouldn't want to have that kind of professor? I would have loved to have this when I was studying. So I was just wondering. I mean, if you do not incentivize professors like that, who would you do that? And by the way, why do you give homework in undergraduate classes? They're grown ups. Yeah, so <clears throat> the student rating system, there's another broken system there. Um, I, I am chained, I am bound because my tenure, <clears throat> my promotion depends on what students think of me. And if I wanna game that, all I have to do is not give tests, or if I do, give out like answer keys or say, here are the questions ahead of time. Or it's um, a keg party. There we go. That, you know, that doesn't work too great at BYU, <laughs> uh, Brigham Young University. It's a religious school. Uh, we, we've actually won, BYU has won the Stone Cold Sober Award. Uh, that's I live in Utah, so no yeah. duh. <laughs> yeah, this, we've won the Stone Cold Sober Award for the last 50 years. Um, no alcohol on campus, can't even have coffee on campus or something like that. Anyway, so yeah, that wouldn't work. But if, if I'm just nice to the students and tell jokes all the time and make the class easy, I will get high ratings, definitely. Um, there will be a few students who are like super eager uh, who would say he was too easy, low score. But for the most part, 
I get really high ratings. Also, I, I, there are statistics around this. If I teach bigger classes, I get lower ratings. If I teach undergraduate classes, I get lower ratings. If I teach required classes, lower ratings. If I'm not funny, lower ratings. Sadly, demographically, um, there are some, some, uh, some things that lead to lower ratings. Me being a male helps me being uh, somewhat I mean, taller. And you're lucky you're not in psychology department or you would have been a political prisoner. <laughs> All sorts of things. So many things lead to actually. Yeah, I mean, if you're a psychology professor, you first of all, it's very weird that you're a male, and the second is that you know you have to be progressive. There's no place for conservatives. Exactly. Yeah. There's there are many factors. Some you're in control of. Some you're not in control of. That determine your your student evaluations, and those student evaluations are again another number that we can use universally, and so we use it because it's easy. Uh, but it can be gamed uh, for better or worse, and it can be biased for better or worse. Um, I'm, I'm in the, I guess, from this standpoint, I'm in the unfortunate position where I teach massive classes. Last semester, I had 1,200 students um, in one class, 1,200 students. And it's an undergraduate required course. Is it online. like a MOOC or, I mean, why is that 1,200 people? Essentially, it's, it's like a MOOC. Yeah. And so my students never meet me. And so their student evals are not very great. Yeah, but they shouldn't uh, because... be allowed to evaluate you if there are 1,200 of them. I mean, then that's an online class. You don't even have to they have do. personal interaction. Yeah, they do. So on, that's it's not tricky. Fair. It, it is a little rough. Um, and so I do everything I possibly can to up those evaluations. I send out videos weekly. I send out uh, funny things. I. I uh, since it's a religious school, I, I send out religious things to make sure they're getting that bit. And I meet with students, I have office hours, I, I do everything I possibly can to make the students feel like they know me and feel like I care about them and want them to succeed. Um, because I have to, I absolutely have to. Now, would I be doing that if, I, if student evaluations were anything? I probably would, because uh, I'm really passionate about teaching. Um, but it, it might not be that case for all. Yeah, uh, things you have to do to keep a job. Um, I think it's very unfortunate when you know when brilliant people have to you know dance to other people's tune just because they have to have a job. And I was just wondering, have you ever considered leaving for industry or you know succeeding in another uh, startup or something? I get this question quite often. Um, I've started help start uh, several companies. And I teach executives who have quite often said, hey, James, if you ever think you're done with this academic thing, come and work for me um, and I'll pay you twice as much. Um, and, and with all these companies, if any of them succeed, uh, will I be done with academia? No, I don't think so. Uh, would I go be the CTO or the CSO or the CIO? Nah, probably not. Um, the academic job is just too cush. It's too nice. Uh, I get to see students grow and develop and change who they are and you know, change the trajectory of their lives for the better. It's hard to get that in, in business, uh, depending on what business you're in. And also, I am the master and commander of my schedule. I, I work as much as I want on whatever I want for the most part, and I do it from wherever I want for the most part. So I can work 30 hours a week or 20 hours a week for some weeks and I have no boss. I, I, I'm not going to leave that. I got a great job. Well, it makes sense. Um, let's talk a little bit about um, the tools that you talk about on your video um, for SCM. Now, what is sure. your personal um, favorite um, between um, CMOS, AMOS, uh, Smart PLS3, M plus, um, and a billion of others? Oh, which one is my least unfavorite? Is that what you asked? Oh, which uh, one was your favorite? But you know, you might as well tell about your least favorite. <laughs> no, my least unfavorite. Um, they're, they're all awkward. Uh, it, 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 it's, it's, it's awkward because it's not natural. You're using a mouse and a, uh, and a screen to manipulate data. It really should be more messy and fluid. And I actually- On a I funny note, do you, uh, 
you don't like their being automated just because you had to do it the hard way. And now everyone has to do it the hard way. Or no, <laughs> no, no. The reason I make videos and, and automation tools is so other people don't have to suffer like I suffered. Um, okay. I had to learn it the hard way and then try to automate it, which is pretty tricky. You got to understand all the edge cases and what's going to break. And I know I did that so that other people wouldn't have to suffer. Uh, but then but, other people don't understand it the way that you do, like in depth and don't come up with papers that they're doing. <laughs> it's true. It, it's this sort of, yeah, catch 22, uh, sort of, I, it, it's something other methodologists don't like about my videos and my plugins. They say, well, you are hiding all the information. Um, you're making it so they can just press a button and then they get all the results. And, uh, yeah, it's true. Um, I try to make videos so they'll understand what, what it means, but I also hope that they've done some reading and, and some schooling to understand it. But I wish there were tools. Back to your question on tools um, and software. I'm, uh, I'm way into augmented reality. I, I build a lot of augmented reality stuff. One of my next apps. Is that oh, structural equation mm -hmm. modeling? I was talking about structural equation modeling. Um, and which one is your yes. favorite there? And can you yes, do that? Yes, so I'm getting at that. Okay. So I don't like the mouse and I don't like the screen to manipulate data and, and analyze data. You should be able to do it with your hands. I, I think you should be able to uh, grab variables or create variables with your hands and move them towards each other and, and relate them by proximity rather than uh, boxes and arrows. Um, and so I want to create a, an augmented reality application that is for data analysis where you can manipulate the data with your hands and mold it like you would a, a sculpture. Um, that's one of the eventual goals. So that, that's my answer. I, I like the application that doesn't exist yet. Uh, if I had to tell you which software do I use most often for my statistical analysis, uh, for simple stuff, SPSS, um, for advanced stuff, structural equation modeling kind of stuff, I use Amos more than anything else. It's what I was trained on, but I use Smart PLS for quite a bit of stuff, and I use M Plus for a few things. I've never taken up R. Um, I've never liked it. It's it's all programming, and I'm a programmer, and I still don't like it. Um, I've never really gotten into Stata, uh, although it can do quite a bit of stuff. I, I never wanted to get into uh, SAS SAS. Uh, it's too big. It's the Adobe of statistics. Um, and MATLAB was never in my arena. It's not really a business school uh, application. Yeah, so Amos, I guess. Mm -hmm. I guess a lot of um, criticism in previous years have been leveled at Amos also, how it calculates um, the um, covariances and uh, the model itself. I think the worst of them probably, which is the easiest, and for that exact reason, the easy target is smart PLS3, but after that, uh, we have um, Amos also. What would you say about some of the shortcomings of Amos? Um, well, my biggest gripe with Amos, I suppose, is that it doesn't really get updated. Uh, IBM bought it. and um, That's the same thing they did with the SPSS. <laughs> yep, bought it and never updated it. Uh, just sat on it. And so Amos is sitting on like 1995 user interface. Um, and it's occasionally updated a couple things, usually just to my uh, chagrin though, because I'll write these plugins and then they'll change some of the backend configurations. They'll break my plugins. Um, I've actually reached out to them, at, but it was, it was a while ago. I reached out to them and said, hey, I drive a lot of traffic to your software. I automate a lot of your software. Um, and, and I have plugged up a lot of holes in the software. Would you like to work with me on something? Can I help you with something? And I got a standard third party uh, kind of response. We don't work with third party developers, um, but they don't work on it in house either. So, yeah. Uh, don't worry about that because, definitely. you know, we, my company has been partnered with um, a IBM here in Pakistan and um, we don't work with them anymore. And trust me, you know, it's, they don't care any, they don't, they don't care about upgrading their products. They're just trying to milk whatever they have. And it has a lot of bugs that no one wants to actually use that. I wanted to have SPSS for my students and the process is so lengthy and complicated. I said, well, 
she was a crack virgin. Sorry for saying that online. <laughs> but um, let's move on to um, so, so some of the analysis. I mean, we've been grilling academics for a while now, but let's talk about uh, some of the ways in which models can be improved. And to find out the um, correlations of different factors, we have something called mediation and moderation. Um, and these are the analysis, and we were partially going to be talking about the process macro um, by Andrew Hayes also. You've probably made one video about that also. Uh, to talk about um, how mediation and moderation can do a little bit of explaining of uh, complicated relationships of different factors um, in, in a mathematical model, and uh, briefly about process um, macro also. So I've never actually used the process macro because I automated the same procedure in Amos. Um, so what they did in SPSS was write the syntax that would essentially run uh, specific indirect effects and moderated effects in uh, SPSS with composite variables, non-latent variables. Um, and I thought, well, I can just do that in Amos. So I wrote a quick plugin to do it for me. Um, and then I could use Amos to do it. So I've never used process, although I hear it's great and it does great stuff. The, the limitation, of course, is that you can only use composite variables um, or, or single object, uh, observed variables or calculations. You can't have latent factors. So that is uh, a little bit of a limitation. Whereas in Amos, with a lot of the plugins, you can just use latent factors. Uh, but as for mediation moderation, uh, these are some of the newer tools, uh, newer as in 30 years old, 40 years old. Uh, that we use in structural equation modeling that go beyond first generation techniques, uh, first generation techniques like basic linear regression, uh, where it's a one independent variable, one dependent variable, or a set of independent, set of dependent, uh, but nothing in between. Uh, so mediation allows you to specify these indirect paths where an effect from an originating predictor uh, lands on a, a, an eventual outcome through the course of many, uh, one or more mediators. And so you can estimate those indirect effects. And that's pretty cool. It allows you to specify more granularly the theory of what's actually happening. When I do this with my students, um, I usually ask them, so what's something we want to predict? And that's our dependent variable. And what's, what do you think predicts that? And that's our independent variable. And then I say, why? And they come up with all these reasons why the independent variable impacts the dependent variable. But all of those reasons are also variables and they're all mediators, all of them. And so if we were to just test the X to Y relationship, ignoring all of those mediating explanations, well, we don't actually understand the relationship. We're, we're missing the majority of that relationship. Mediation allows us to test that very specific uh, mechanism of transfer of the effect from X to Y. For moderation, moderation allows us to better understand the contexts under which a relationship is valid or how that relationship may alter based on some context or the presence of some other variable. So whereas X affects Y in general, that relationship might be stronger or weaker if uh, you're in one group versus another group, or if you have more of some third variable or less of some variable. And so that also just gives us more precision in modeling, something that first generation techniques couldn't do. Although there are some ways around it to do it like indirectly uh, with first generation techniques. Uh, SEM definitely allows a more precise uh, specification of those, uh, those uh, relationships. I think that might be the differentiating point uh, in industry and academia that, you know, they're using the first generation tools, classification and aggression to make sure that it's easy to explain. So what have you got something called, uh, which academics, um, you know, know with the terminology model parsimony. So what they do is in industry is that, you know, when they create a model, they, they do um, regular regularization dropout. Um, so that they drop the nose to see, you know, if it's if actually affecting the model, trying to actually minimize the amount of uh, noise. Um, and I was just wondering, is academic probably more under um, criticism because of second generation um, tools that are that are over complicating the simple uh, tools like classification and regression? Or is it because um, the the brunt of explanation comes back, um, which this are not always able to do. Uh, so what is that um, that 
second generation tools lack in terms of explainability? So second generation tools, because they are so, because they're running such complicated equations, uh, the limitation is that they rarely ever show those equations. Um, I can just draw a box and an arrow and the equation is hidden underneath. And those equations can get pretty uh, out of control, um, pages and pages, just to specify the equation uh, to run to, to estimate that model. So that's probably the biggest limitation in, in SEM is that you don't know, unless you do know, but very few people do know, you don't know what's going on underneath the hood. Uh, a lot is hidden. Whereas in first generation techniques, the procedures are fairly simple. Uh, like I said, maybe a few in independent variables and a dependent variable. Well, you can write that as a multiple regression equation that takes up one line, uh, y equals mx plus b, or however many mx's you need. Um, whereas the structural equation model is quite a bit more sophisticated. And so people just don't understand it. Even those who use it uh, regularly might not understand what's going on under the hood. So there is an opportunity to uh, ignorantly misspecify models and then come out with the results that don't actually uh, represent reality. They don't approximate reality. And that's a crush thing because most people argue that, you know, the structural equation modeling does not have a home outside social sciences or sciences that actually have a human component in them. Um, so, for example, when you're talking about, you talked about um, having this discussion with your students on um, how do different um, items correlate with um, a construct and there's a missing piece in between that can be explained through latent variable. Um, and these are the things that would only happen in social settings because in industrial settings with the tabular data um, and solid numbers, you have a dependent variable and all of the rest of them are independent variables that you have to use in the regression analysis to find out um, how likely we are to get the dependent variable. Do you actually see a use of structural regression modeling outside the social um, sciences? I mean, Mark, you've written a paper about that. How is that, how is that becoming more popular? But I'm not sold on the idea. So uh, funny you ask, uh, yesterday we had the big launch of HC Moneyball, a human capital Moneyball uh, company, um, our big partnership with the conference board, which is this big, um, big association made up of, uh, that is a parent association for hundreds of other associations. And HC Moneyball, uh, they do structural equation modeling on human capital and financial numbers which are non-behavioral, non-psychological, non-cognitive, uh, non-attitudinal, non-psychometric. These are, these are objective numbers like uh, revenue and, and, and uh, how many people of every demographic you have and, and various hard numbers, uh, what your losses were, what your assets are. And we use structural equation modeling to make sense of that data. It's not the only thing HC Moneyball does, but it's one of the offerings they provide. Um, and so, yes, I do see an opportunity to use SEM outside of uh, social science and in harder sciences where uh, variables are objective. Um, it's just new and people are trying to figure out how it fits and whether it fits and what offering it can uh, provide. But how do you actually develop theory to substantiate your hypothesis in these situations? For example, if trying to predict sales and you know you have some indicators that might be related to sales and then all of them go through um, a certain latent variable to sales. How do you actually you know use them um, in because these are not survey responses where you have one to five Likert scale. So these are real yeah. numbers. So how do you actually make a theory and then and even if you do, I mean, where's the ROI uh, in terms of uh, business um, expense justification for that approach? So you're right when it comes to latent variables. Um, for the most part, uh, latent variables are well suited to surveys and, and responses on, on a survey. In objective variables, it's kind of hard to form a latent construct around a bunch of objective measures. It's not impossible. In fact, that's what factor analysis is for, is to find those relationships among uh, possibly uh, unrelated, but probably just multi-dimensional sets of data, uh, sets of variables. 
And uh, so it is possible. And even in things, let's, let's do an example. Uh, let's say we want to affect uh, return on people investment. So every, for every dollar we spend on people, we get X more revenue. That, that's an easy mathematical thing to look at. We, we have the numbers for that. It's a basic regression. But there is a reason for that, right? There's some change happening in between those two variables, some mediating variable. Um, and hopefully we have data for that. Maybe it's uh, measures of productivity, which, are, which can be objective, uh, depending on your industry. Uh, so we'd say that productivity mediates that relationship between money spent on our employees and our eventual revenue. Um, so there is an opportunity there for path modeling, the path modeling side of SEM. Uh, it, it's not full-blown structural equation modeling with latent causal models, but it is a form of structural equation modeling, uh, path modeling. And do you think ATMN is going to publish um, a white paper with the result at some point so that other organizations find it easy to adapt that, uh, if, that if they have the structural data to um, you know, throw into the pipeline? That's definitely one of our intents. Yeah, we'll be doing some white papers and we've been doing some conference presentations, keynotes, uh, speak, speeches, things like that, just to get the word out. Interesting that you talked about the path analysis, which is one of the most um, used one in policy um, papers with World Bank and IMF and um, the uh, demand Oh, and supply prediction and uh, forecasting. How apt do you think path analysis um, is for sales data um, and uh, the data that um, businesses generate uh, in order to substantiate substantiate a certain uh, path flow from the indicators and to the constructs? Uh, it may be very relevant. It really depends on the type of data you have. Uh, if the relationships are simplistic which is rare unless it's a mathematical relationship. If it depends on several processes or people, uh, then the relationships are rarely simplistic. And as long as you're collecting data for intervening variables, then path analysis is great. Uh, the issue you run into is uh, that data might not be stored anywhere. And so you have to change your logging practices or your data collection practices to accommodate path analysis. Well I mean, if the relationship is so simple, why do you even need path analysis? I mean, we could use simple multiple regression or classification or the first generation tools. Um, if that's not that complicated. Unless there's mediation or moderation going on. Mediation and moderation do not sit in the first generation tools. Uh, they're, they're home in, in path analysis and SEM. I think it's a very good point that you made out because that's exactly the problem that I normally face um, in industrials. Uh, data scientists, um, which I mean, they can probably do mediation and moderation, but what's the uh, business benefit of doing that um, on a data where you simply have to forecast the um, sales figures uh, or let's say pre predict the coming sales or seasonality and things like this? Because from a social point of view, mediation and moderation would help you understanding phenomena that's happening, but that wouldn't actually be helpful in predicting um, anything. And that partially also brings me to the question that I asked uh, Mark Walsh, and they were working on that. And one of my other fellow um, who's working um, on PLS SEM, you probably know him, Somia Ray, is working on the PLS Predict uh, module, and I believe he has an R um, library for that also. PLS SEM or CBS SEM, it doesn't really help in predicting things. It can help you what's happening. And that's probably the second stage of research, but that's the ultimate stage that actually creates value is a prediction so that you have information beforehand. And that's where um, it lacks um, seriously in, and thus it's not as um, welcomed in industry as uh, some of the other tools. What do you have to say about that? I agree. Uh, SEM is largely for uh, confirming theories, for seeing relationships among models are among variables and uh, it's very cross-sectional in nature, uh, not causal, although we may call it causal modeling because there's an, a predictor and an outcome. Uh, those predictors and outcomes uh, usually are not separated by time um, and there are no controls for confounds for the most part. Um, 
so I, if you want to get to causal analysis, you really got to start doing experiments and lagged analysis and things like that, which SEM isn't the best suited to. Okay, and one of the more thing, uh, one of the most important thing is that when in industry you predict something or you have a model, you deploy that somewhere like in a web app um, or a cloud server, like cl anything that's client facing. With the academic data, there's no publishing of that unless you're doing it with the R Shiny, um, so they have a gallery for that. This trend of not sharing the information uh, or putting it out. But how, how do you fix that? I mean, for example, even if you have a kind of structural uh, equation modeling, there has to be a tool that publish it, uh, publishes it for the open peer review, um, like in our shiny manner, um, or something that tells people that what what's happening there. So I, I don't know that I understand your question. Um... So for example, if you have made a PLS structural equation model and the diagram, so in R, what happens is that you can press the button and publish it um, on a website automatically uh, for people to actually play with that, interact with different variables, do their analysis, see the diagrams, and things like that. There's nothing um, like that for PLS unless you copy paste the diagrams and you know, write about that and um, fill in the numbers for all criterions. Do you also think that there's, there needs to be a shift for this automatic uh, publication of the results? And that, by the way, would help with the peer review also so that you cannot tamper with the data afterwards. Certainly, more transparency around the data is always better. Like I said, more information, more transparency, better science. Um, as for replicability of the data analysis, uh, because the tools to conduct SEM are so easy to use, I think that's one reason we haven't gone to that model is because I can recreate someone's model if I have their data. It's a piece of cake to recreate the model, take me minutes. Um, so I don't know that there's a strong need to have uh, uh, the model itself published in an interactive way. I mean, that's assuming that you um, have the data and then you um, can do it quickly. But for most people, it's like another step that they have to do it before True. they actually have. For example, if you look at the nature papers, you know, they have the data and you know they have the visualizations and you know you can um, look at how they uh, reach that. For example, for most psychological uh, research, now you have to submit the R script also. Um, the, the code that you use to be able to replicate the data. So you'll simply add the data file into the same path, run the equation, and then you will replicate the same steps. That's easier both for the reviewer and um, the publisher as well. Well, let's um, talk a little bit about uh, what would you do if you weren't a scientist? Um, so if, if, you were, if you were to be invisible for one day, what would you do and what would you want to be? If, if I were not a professor? You couldn't be a professor in your imagination. So if you're invisible now and you could be anything without fear of um, you know, losing anything, what would you be? Well, as a kid, um, I was quite odd. I carried around an invention book. Um, I had several invention books, books full of inventions uh, that I, I drew when I was bored in class. And I would come out with it, just the most ridiculous things. Um, but using my imagination constantly to just invent new things. And uh, so if I were not a professor, I would probably be what, what, like a mechanical engineer, I guess, uh, inventing stuff. Okay, or just a curator of inventions. <laughs> sure. Yeah, I I'd, I'd actually build the things I, I designed. Yeah. So that invention book actually had inventions that you invented or what? Yeah, they were just my designs. Crazy ah, ideas. okay, cool. What did you yeah. design? That was just really yeah. interesting. Yeah, I, I drew them and wrote them and, and made all the specifications on them from the age of like, oh man, uh, probably age of eight onward. I always had an invention book with me at school um, because I, I got bored easily. Uh, and so in class, if I'm, I was ever done with my work, I'd start doodling and, and drawing out inventions and coming up with silly ideas to solve problems. Do you ha still have that lying around? You could probably pr publish that. And, you know, I saw one of the books yesterday, uh, which explains statistics in doodles. And, you know, a lot of people find it funny. For example, Josh, you know, he makes uh, ukulele music videos about the statistics. It's, it, it could be a big thing. Maybe it's, it's right next to my bed right now. Yeah, I, I know exactly where one of them is. I've lost a couple others um, in, through the years, but 
Yeah, if you really publish that, would be really stuff. great, actually. <laughs> That'd be fun. It's silly stuff. Uh, of course, all stuff is it's still silly. You don't know who's going to be benefiting it from them. Um, and of course, uh, there are people who find a utility in things that we think that um, they're silly. But um, it's been a long journey um, in your life and a lot of moving, uh, a lot of learning, um, setbacks, um, as well as accomplishments. Um, now you have your own children um, and you, you have four daughters, uh, I believe. Um, yeah. Do you think that, you know, they share your curiosity, intellect, or you know, their mother's wisdom or what? I hope they do. Uh, some of them are more passionate than the others. I, I was just thinking this last week, it sure would be nice if one of them went and got their PhD and became a professor. Uh, that would be just so re rewarding for me as a parent. And I hope you really want them, them to go through the same misery as you did. <laughs> I loved it. I love school. I even as an elementary Minus school, the misery. Kid, I, loved it. Uh, I didn't have much misery. I'm, I'm just not that type. In high school, I loved high school and undergrad loved it, loved all my all my schooling. Maybe that's why I'm a professor because I just like it so much. Yeah, there's something about teaching that, you know, and keeps you um, awake and um, happy. I get a lot of emails. I mean, the psychological um, test um, tool that translated from English to Urdu and gave it my undergraduate students. The results were phenomenal. I was invited to give a workshop um, to the professors, how you do that. And ever since I get emails from a lot of people, random people about how useful that has been and how thankful they are and it's changing lives. And I think that's one of the high points of uh, being a teacher and a mentor and um, someone who um, who hasn't done anything like on a regular basis, but some things, at some point did something that's being viewed around the world and it's changing people's lives. So. How how do you see? I mean, are, are they very different from each other? Your daughters? I mean, do they oh, are they naturally very. inclined towards science or? Uh, they're yeah, they're all completely different. Um, so one of them, she she carries an invention book and invents things all the time. Okay, that's easy. Um, yeah, so she definitely takes after me. Uh, another one, she uh, loves to read and write. Uh, she's actually. Uh, she has a job as a narration writer for a company um, and also as an audio, uh, as, a, as a voice actor. Um, and one of the others, she's a figure skater. She's competing at nationals uh, this year. Wow. And the other one's seven. So she, she's seven. <laughs> she's okay. a kid. She likes playing with friends and jumping on the trampoline and playing with dolls and things. Seems like all of them are very accomplished in their own right. Um, and I'm, I'm sure a lot of credit goes to you also to give them the independence and confidence um, that's required to, to be able to achieve such things. Uh, when, when you're teaching, um, and finally, that could be your message to a lot of people who are listening to you uh, today about your uh, work, about your life. What would you like to say to uh, people who are listening to you at the moment, who have listened to your um, story? I mean, what are some of the key factors um, in life um, to, to to be able to succeed, to learn new things, to have different experiences. I mean, what have you learned from life? Oh, so many things. Uh, stay oh, curious. We have time. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> <Okay>. um, <laughs> we're coming up on two hours here. Yeah, it's um, a long one. Uh, my, my success, I think, is largely driven by my curiosity and staying passionate about everything. Uh, whatever I whatever I find passion in, I pursue, and I stay curious about things. Um, I'm constantly building and inventing and creating, and uh, if I find something to be interesting, I go down that rabbit hole, and and pursue it and build stuff around it. Um, so, figure out what you're passionate about and pursue it. James, which is what everybody's going to say, I'm sure, but it's true. That's why everybody says it. Yeah, well, a few people actually demonstrate that. Um, a lot of people just say that. Uh, and you are some definitely someone who who's um, shown people um, the, the walk uh, also as well as um, the talk. James, it's been a blast uh, talking to you. Um, it's so such an honor to be talking to someone who is oh, I personally have learned from uh, during uh, my studies. Um, and I'm sure 
a lot of people around the world uh, who are listening to you at the moment uh, are very thankful. And for the first time, see you in person as well um, on on an uh, interview. Thank you so much for joining us. Happy to. Thanks.